Hello, I'm Mike Browning. Welcome to Let God Speak. It never ceases to amaze me that the Creator God sent His own Son to of all places this tiny planet despite having this massive universe. So why did He do it? Why did He choose planet Earth? That's the question we're exploring on Let God Speak today. Well, folks, we've got with us on our panel today Barry Harker and Jeff Yulden, and we're very glad to have them along. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming. Glad to be here. Yes. Um, as we open this very interesting subject today, we'd invite you to join us in prayer. Father in heaven, once again, we want to come before you and ask that your Holy Spirit will guide us and all those tuning into this program as we share the message of your um, work to reach out into the, this little community, this little planet that we're a part of. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Interesting, folks. I want to start off with looking at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. And I'd invite um, those who are tuning in to turn to this scripture with us if you'd like to do that. Um, it begins this way, Hebrews 1, verse 1. God, who in different ways and in different manners spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things. And I want you to notice the last part of this, and it says by whom also he made the worlds. Um, this intrigues me, this statement. Um, God has created a huge universe. Now, we know that there are billions of galaxies, each with billions of stars and potentially billions of worlds uh, that could be inhabited like our own. And of course, this one, this scripture here in verse 2 of Hebrews 1 tells us that he made the worlds. So the question that we're interested in is, well, why is God so interested in planet Earth, Jeff? Well, I think the question that you've just asked is a very relevant question because the bigger the telescope, the more we're discovering mm, that's right. out there. So, you know, the, the smaller we become, yeah. you know, in, in the universe, so to speak. So the fact that God is interested, I guess the best illustration that I can think of is like a parent. Mm -hmm. I mean, a parent might have six children or five or three or two or one. But he loves or she loves those children That's just true. as much, number six, as number one. Mm -hmm. um, because we have a capacity to be able to, to, to love all our children. Yes. And I guess God is like that when he created this earth. He loves us all. And it's interesting that as you read the Bible, the emphasis on the Bible is father, son, you know, um, as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth us. So we're his children, his, his kids, and he loves us like that. Yes, yeah. he uses that family illustration. So we're not just self-centered narcissists, Barry, think, oh, <laughs> Jeff, thinking that he is so interested in us above all others. He really is interested in us. No, he is very interested in oh. us. And uh, the very fact that he, um, he gave us Jesus, you know, his son, because Christ, in, in giving us Jesus, he really gave us everything. Yes. Like, for example, I could share my kidney with you, Mike. I could give my kidney to Barry. And that would be a very, very important gift, especially and if you were on dialysis again. and so yeah. forth and, mm. and, and needed it. But if I gave my life for you, that's another step up again, isn't mm, it? Mm. And, and, and in giving us, saving us, look, God gave us Jesus. Yes. He, you, he, heaven couldn't give us anything be, bigger or better. So that's the illustration the of how God loves us. greatest resource of heaven. I notice in John mm. chapter 3 and verse 17, it says, and these are actually the words of Jesus himself. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. That's encouraging to know but that the world through him might be saved. So it's a worldwide focus he has, mm. and it's the world yes. that he came to save because of our, our lostness, if you like. Uh, this wasn't an afterthought, was it? No, it wasn't. If you look at uh, Revelation 13 and verse 8, it says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And in 1 Peter 1 and verse 20, it talks about eternity. So this was a decision that was taken in the councils of the Godhead mm -hmm. way back in the uh, eons of eternity. 
okay. that should this come to this, then Jesus would come as our saviour. Yes. The yes. fact that we were made in God's image indicates, I believe, his special love for us, special okay. love and concern. Okay. There was something special about the human creation. Back in um, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, we have an insight into just who it was who was sent here to this earth. Chapter 7, verse 14 says this of Isaiah, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive mm. and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. And we know what Emmanuel means. Emmanuel means God with us. Yes. So it was God himself, the divine one, who came on this rescue mission to the earth here. Um, what does that tell you about him? Well, you know, Jesus told a story or a parable uh, about the 90 and 9, mm -hmm. um, which I've always been intrigued with because we often use that to think of the sinner that's lost and comes back into the fold. But in actual fact, when you think about that, that relationship is not quite correct because for every person who goes astray, 99 don't stay f faithful. It's the other way around, okay. really, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And I think what Jesus was illustrating here, his, his, the main point was the fact that this world was the one world that went astray mm. in the universe. The mm. 90 and 9 stayed firm mm -hmm. and, and true to God. Mm. And yet G God was willing to invest all of heaven mm -hmm. in saving us, giving us another chance. I mean, the Bible says that if God had wiped this world out, it would have been like a drop of a bucket. You know mm. what it's like. You have a bucket full of water and a drop out onto the... Uh, the you don't the even table. notice a difference. You wouldn't even mm. notice, like the mm. small dust of the balance, he says. Mm. I mean, if you wipe your finger across the balance, it doesn't make any difference. It's so insignificant. And, and Isaiah is saying that if God had wiped this world out of existence when it mm. sinned, the rest of the universe would have weighed it up like the small dust of the balance, like the drop of a bucket. That's how insignificant we are. In terms of size. Yeah, Jeff. Yeah, well, in, in terms of the universe, we are so insignificant, mm. really. Mm. But not apparently in the eyes of God, and that's the marvellous thing. That's about the it. wonderful thing, yes. Um, I love this description um, in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1, which is a bit like the job description for this one who was to come, the one who was to be Emmanuel. And he himself is actually speaking here, prophetic voice, and he says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek, bind up the brokenhearted, and here's a, here's a ministry of compassion, proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Um, this reveals something to us about the compassion of a God for our lost world, even though, as you say, in terms of size, which are tiny, yet apparently not lacking in value in the eyes of God. That's the beautiful thing about it, Jeff. Yeah. Well, it's like our children, they may, they may do things that are bad and so forth, but we still love them, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was our need, really, that appealed to God's heart. If he's a, mm. if he's a God of compassion, he sees this fallen race you know, with uh, no hope, and so it touches his heart. And so yeah. this is the thing that really appeals to him. This mm. is, I've got to save these people. They're made in my image. Yes. And this brings us back to the question of value again. God is placing value on us. We might not place the same value on each other. Look at the way people are treating each other in the world. Mm. But it's yeah. the value that God places on us that gives us real value. Isn't it nice to know that God thinks like this about us? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's tremendously encouraging, isn't it? Mm. And I hope that everybody else feels as encouraged about that as I do. Um, right, it's, so, I first, it's such an encouraging thing. It, it is. It's, it's so wonderful. It brings you hope. Absolutely. Uh, I remember when I first began to study the Bible and, and feel the claims of Christ upon my heart, I, I remember realising that um, God regards us as, as so important, so wonderful. Uh, if we'd been the only person mm. that had ever been into error and done the wrong thing, Jesus would have still come and died. And we were the only planet. Apparently. The only planet, the mm. one lost mm. sheep. Yeah. And, and another thing, Mike, I've found too, is that God is for us. Yeah. You know, many of us have the concept good, that God, mm. when we d make a mistake, God's there to give us a kick further along the, the path, like kicking a can along the street. Mm. Mm -hmm. But that's not the picture the Bible gives of God at all. Mm. God is there to, to rescue us and, to, and he's for us, not against us. Yes. And that's a wonderful thing to know. Even though we make mistakes, 
God is on our side and he wants us to be saved despite that. That's wonderful. Thank mm. you, Jeff. It mm. is. Mm. And I love the, the picture that of Jesus himself. He comes now and here he is reaching out to people's lives. And look at the kind of things that he did. I'm looking now in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 35. I'm going to read verse 35 and 36 here. This is what it says. Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and disease among the people. And then verse 36, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. Now that word compassion is a lovely word, isn't it? Mm, it is. Mm. He was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. And I thought, well, that's how he thinks about us. He looks down on us in our struggles and he has compassion. We can take courage from this. Right? There's no situation that we find ourselves in that doesn't arouse the compassion of our mighty God mm. and the person of, of our Saviour here. And the important thing, Mike, is that this is good news for us to share with others. It is. You know, we're mm. talking about mission. Mm. And, and, and Christ came to say that which was lost. Yeah. And when, as you say, he's, he's compassionate, he's, he's for us, not against us. Mm. Once we get that into our minds, and it's sometimes hard for it to really settle in our minds, once we mm. believe that God is for us, not against us, it mm. changes everything. It does. Look, a, a God like this is almost too good to be true. Is it too good to be true, Barry? How can we be sure it is true? Well, there are a number of lines of evidence that we can mm. appeal to, to show that it's actually true in a uh, propositional sense. Uh, the prophecies, for example, would be one of the ways in which we could clearly indicate that Jesus is the Son of God. He was who he said he was. Yes. And that he did come to do exactly what he said he came to do. Yes. And uh, this can give us absolute confidence. This is not a religion that is just based on some sort of mystical teaching. This mm -hmm. is a revealed religion where the claims are either true or they're not true. And God gives us lines of evidence, whether it's history, whether it's prophecy, whether it's personal experience, yes. we can know for sure that uh, God has sent his son to, to help us and okay. to save us. And, and we can experience the peace of God in our own lives, can't we? We can, we can. all the things yeah. that the Bible talks about that we may experience, we do. And that kind of authenticates the whole message of the scripture. Well, you feel compassion, mm. don't you? Yes, when you, you see one of your children or one of your grandchildren in trouble, mm -hmm. you feel that compassion. So we're simply reflecting God in that particular case. How do you, how do you explain compassion in this ruthless world that we're seeing yeah. at present? Yeah, yeah. There has to be something divine outside of the human race. That's a lovely thing. Look, moving on, uh, even though Jesus of necessity came from a specific nationality, he was an Israelite, he was mm. a Jew, um, was his, his mission limited specifically to Israel when he was here? Oh, certainly not, Mike. Yeah. Um, but he had to come somewhere, didn't he? Yeah. He had to be born somewhere in some right. place. Yes. And God chose the Jews. I don't know why God chose the Jews. I mean, that's one of the questions we'll have to ask God when we mm. get home to heaven because, uh, interesting point. But he chose the Jews and that's the avenue from which Christ was, uh, was brought into the world as the, as the God-man. Yeah. But... You know, even the angels that announced his birth, or the shepherds, I should say, that announced his birth, um, said that this was something for all people. Yes, peace on earth. Mm -hmm. Goodwill good to all men. Yes. yes, I think that was a very powerful it's, point. Yes. And he chose shepherds. Now, you know, we've got to recognise that shepherds back in those days were not like we regard shepherds today. They, mm. were, the, they were the bottom of the bucket. You know, mm -hmm. they were the worst. They were often criminals and, and, and vagabonds. And the fact that the, the announcement was made to that type of person should mm. give us all hope because, mm. as I said, you look at the, the way shepherds were regarded back there. They, but these particular shepherds were men of faith, weren't they? They had to have been because they were ready for such a revelation. Yes, but the, 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 what I'm saying is that mm. the, the shepherds as, as, as a group a, of yeah. people were mm. not the piece of people that you and I probably would have chosen ourselves mm. to announce the birth of, of, of Christ because mm. they were not regarded well in mm. society. Now, Jesus mightn't have, uh, we don't know why that Jesus chose the Jews mm. to be his agents, but we know what brief they were given. And this is consistent with that brief. This is mm. Isaiah 49 and verse 6. And he said, it's a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel, I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. So, so it's always been yeah. God's intention to save the entire human okay. race. Okay, the Israelites were to be a missionary nation, actually, yes. weren't they? That was God's plan, and they were to go out to the world. And imagine had they 
as a people done that? What an offense. Well, they were, to, they were to be a light to the world, but mm. when they failed to do that, God scattered them so they could take that light to the world. Yeah. They were placed in the center of the earth, the they, Bible says. That's they were why perfectly placed for the, the word job. Mediterranean mm. means center sea, and they were placed in the center of the mm. earth so that everybody coming from the north had to travel through, coming from the south, coming from the, uh, th from the east. They all had to go through Israel. But the trouble is they never shared what, they took it exclusively to themselves instead mm. of sharing the message and yeah. that was and the, the and the borders of Israel were to expand, weren't they? Because mm. you remember in the time of um, King David and King Solomon, the borders of Israel were quite enlarged compared with what they are today. So when they did the right thing, and they were mm. the light to the mm. Gentiles, peoples were drawn to them and that was God's original intention. Yeah. Yes, there's nice a, there's a passage in Zechariah 8 where it says, you know, ten men shall take hold of the robe of a Jew saying, let us go with you, for we've heard that God is with you. Mm. So that's what God wants us to do. He wants mm. us to demonstrate in our lives yeah. that he is with us. That will have a powerful influence on those people around us. We won't yeah. have to be forcing our views on them. They'll mm. be coming and asking us okay. about it. And God wants to bless us and, and prosper us so that that so may actually happen as part of that. Well, some mm. of that is true. We see what the point that Barry's making there is a very good point. I mean, we see that with the health message that God mm. has given Mm. Mm. to us mm. and as people come to us and find that that um, you know we live longer than everybody else mm. because we've followed the plan of God and if we followed it completely we'd live a lot longer than you know, <laughs> yes. and people mm. want to yeah. find out and mm. that's yeah. the very point that Barry's yeah. making. Yeah. Mm. yeah okay um, Jesus had a forerunner John the Baptist who prepared the way for him um, what did he t say about the scope of Jesus message? Yes. Well, he said the sins of the world, didn't he? Mm. He did. Behold yes. the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the, not the just world. the Jews, the world. but the whole world. So the emphasis was always the world, wasn't it? And that was such an important point here. Um, and it's interesting too, Mike, that Jesus is regarded... I mean, I went to the Philippines and I remember seeing Christ pictured in the Philippines as a Filipino. Yes. You go to China and he's a Chinaman. Mm. You come to Australia and he's an Australian. Mm. It seems that Jesus is not just regarded as a Jew, he's regarded as someone for everybody, okay. which is what the Bible presents him. This is 1 John 2 and verse 2, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Mm. Yeah. That's right. So what does this tell us about the scope of his sacrifice, Barry? This particular well, it day. was sufficient for anyone. So the no one, no one has an excuse. The whole world, yeah, it's it was amazing. Sufficient. Yeah, yeah, the provision was made for all of our salvation. Mm. Yeah. Now it's an interesting point. Jesus didn't just come to teach good ethics, did he? Like, uh, like some of the great religious teachers that have uh, come through history. He did teach for good ethics, like love your enemies, mm -hmm. um, do good unto others as they would have you do unto you, and so on. But it was much more than that. He came to die for the sins of the world. And I'd like to just refer to Acts chapter 1, verse 8 for a moment, folks. Um, this is a wonderful statement, Acts 1, 8. These are, if you like, Jesus' last words, famous last words to his disciples. And he said this, You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, mm. and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and unto the, unto the uttermost parts of the earth. In other words, every single square centimeter inch of this planet was to be covered by the message of the gospel, the good news of salvation. This is what he wants to do. Um, but why Jerusalem first, Barry? Because it's like the center of a pond. You throw a stone into the pond that ripples out. Mm -hmm. They were first to go to Jerusalem, yes. that is the, uh, the Jewish people, then um, Judea. Judea right across the country, then to Samaria, and then to the outermost parts of the earth. So the ripple was going out from the centre. Mm. So that also defines our responsibility. Our first responsibility is to those who are closest to us. Yes, the people we know. So we can't yeah. pretend to go out and get a message to the world if we're not living that life in our own families, mm. in our own churches, in our own communities. And yes, sometimes true. they're the hardest people to, uh, to <laughs> win, aren't they? Sometimes, sometimes yeah. it's easier to go out mm. rather than to witness it is, and I think this is where prayer is the most important uh, thing, resource we have in reaching those that we know really well. How successful was he in reaching his own people, Jeff? Well, on the surface, it looked fairly limited, didn't it? Mm. I mean, you've got to say that, 
By the time he died on the cross, there weren't an awful lot that were following him. But by the time the day of Pentecost came, many, I believe, that responded to Peter's preaching on the mm. day of Pentecost had already been contacted and influenced by the teachings of Jesus yes. when he was on the earth. Yes. Mm. And, and I think that ought to be an encouragement to us that we don't always see the results of what we do. We are, we don't. God calls mm. us to be faithful and to do the work of witnessing and sharing our faith mm -hmm. and leave God with the results. There will be results if we're yeah. faithful. Yeah, and, and there were in Jerusalem, 3,000 on that first day yeah. were baptized yeah. into Christ. Later on, I think it was 5,000. So, you know, there were tremendous responses, really. So God did do some amazing things. Uh, Christianity did go to the world, despite that. Yeah. Christianity went to the world. Um, how did God do it, though? How did God do it? it you know, he, yes, he, he had that, that response that you referred to. Um, but instead of millions, he only had thousands. How did he get to the world? Person by person, wasn't it? Yes. Remember, Colossians says, Paul said in Colossians that by the end of the first century, or by the time of his death, which was before the end of the first century, the whole world had heard about the gospel. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, and uh, it was done on a more on a one-to-one -one basis, wasn't it? Yes. I mean, there, there, there were preachers, but... Uh, mainly it was done on a one-to-one -one basis. You know, we find the early church and house churches mm. and so forth and small groups and, and, and so forth. And I think there's a wonderful lesson for us today too that uh, God wants us to be faithful. Mm. And in, he's not limited by small numbers of people, Jeff, is he? Um, I mean, we saw with Daniel and his companions that uh, all he needed was one faithful man and the whole world got to hear. That's a pretty impressive thing. In one thing. week. But he also, yes. wanted, he also wanted points of light, just as mm. Israel was a geographic location. Uh, he also wants us as the modern Israel, the, the, the Christian Israel, to be points of light wherever we live so that we're also geographic centres that spread across the entire earth. Mm -hmm. And it says here in uh, Colossians 1.23, the text that you alluded to, Jeff, which says, which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven. So this was in Paul's day. Yes. So how did that happen? Yeah. Amazing. It must have just been one person at a time. It was. And yeah. of course, there was the moving of the Holy Spirit on people's lives mm. and yes. through those who were endeavouring to share. Yes. Jesus was quite confident it would go to the world, I notice, in Matthew chapter 24, which yes. is that... Wonderful chapter where... The gospel shall be preached to all the world. That's mm. the one, Jim. Mm, yeah. It'll be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations and then shall the end come, referring yes. to his second mm. coming, of course. Exactly. So he knew it would happen. He, was, uh, he had no doubt about it. Mm. And that's encouraging to us too because, you know, we're looking yet to see that go to the entire world, uh, to every little hamlet and house and hut and whatever it is around the world. So we're looking forward to that great day. I think an answer to your, an answer to your question before... How did it go? Uh, Zechariah 4 and verse 6 says, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Yes. And so I believe that would have been the way in which the, the message went. There would have been mm. representatives, but the spirit would have a attended their work okay. and it would have been very powerful. And that's how that message mm. would have got out to the entire world. God's spirit is actually leading in, in the work of reaching the world. And we are apt to forget that sometimes because we are human beings here mm doing what we can, but if we relied on the Holy Spirit, I'm sure we're going to see much, much more happen. Than well, I think we've got to remember that God doesn't require a lot of people. Mm. You know, we think of numbers as being yeah. important, and numbers are important. Uh, You've got to have people, but your point is made. The, well made. the fact is that if, if you go back to that story you mm. alluded to before, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and their faithfulness of not bound, what happened to that image, we don't know, but the message went out to the whole of the then Babylonian world that the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego was the God to be worshipped within one week. Mm. The whole mm. of that pagan world heard the gospel. So God is not looking upon or doesn't require numbers only. He mm. requires faithfulness. And if we are faithful, God, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, will pro propel us to a world's disfavour that will draw attention to the issues in the last days and almost overnight the whole world will know mm. and be brought to a decision, I believe, over... So that the working of the Holy Spirit is not over yet, is it? He's still moving out Absolutely. to reach, into, yes. reach to people. Um, I noticed that, um, there's a, one beautiful thought that I read one time was that the Holy Spirit, as he was given on the day of Pentecost, has never been withdrawn from the Christian church. So 
that same power is still available to the Christian yes. family. Well, that was the promise today. in uh, Matthew 28, wasn't it? I'll be with you until the end of the world. He was with you. He was with us by His Spirit mm. right till the end of yeah. the world. Jeff, were most of those early Christians great preachers? Do you think? I mean, there were some, obviously. There were. I mean, there was Paul mm. um, and Peter, but the vast majority. The rest of the disciples, we don't uh, find that the Bible places a lot of emphasis on their mm. preaching ability, does mm. it? I think it was faithfulness on the part of the small persons being faithful in, 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 in what they're doing. And then Pentecost and when Paul went and raised up churches in, in the different areas, mm. those people who were faithful and, and who the Spirit of God were working upon responded when it was given. That's why I think the book of Acts is, is gives us the uh, the criteria of evangelism when it says in Acts 20, 20 that they uh, preached publicly and they went from door to door. Yep. Mm. That's the that's the uh, operatus mandi for us all, I think, yeah. today, yeah. that we must have public preaching to bring faith through to a decision, but that's predicated by the fact that we have faithful members everywhere mm. who are being faithful and telling their neighbours about these things and then they're brought to a decision in the big meetings. Okay. Okay. Mm. Yeah, so the good. two things must go together. That was mm. the way the book of Acts, that's the way the early church operated yeah. and I believe it's the way the church mm. should operate today. It's interesting too that um, the people of Israel still were scattered throughout the world, weren't they? And mm. you notice you read, you read through the book of Acts how um, the message was first taken to those gatherings of Jewish people. Yes. And, and of those, some of them believed and they continue to share their faith. And I see Christians dotted throughout the world in that same manner today and responding to the message, reaching out and touching people where they are. And if you've got a message of Jesus' resurrection, you can imagine that would have been an electrifying message mm -hmm. to get out and that would have assisted in the, uh, in the distribution of that message throughout the world. Yeah. Now, Jesus himself only had three and a half years, didn't he? He did. And he'd come to reach the world, right? Mm. Remember that? And he only had three and a half years. And yet, despite that, he had a fond regard, didn't he, for the one person audience. You think of the numbers of people, number of times he only reached out to one person. Nicodemus, Nicodemus woman, at uh, woman at the well of Samaria, and even Pilate, you know. So, folks, we can all do what we can to reach out to, message, to, to people with God's message of love. And I think that's God's message to us. Some of us can preach to 100,000 people. Most of us are called to reach persons one at a time. And we can all reach out faithfully and compassionately to the people that God brings across our pathway and share Jesus' wonderful message of love and hope. And I'd like to suggest we ask God to bring people across our pathway like that. Well, thank you for joining us on Let God Speak today. Um, you can email us on the address on your screen. Do join us next time. God bless.